put on this computer. All right. Um, as he and I are working together on a, on a book project about his life. Um, and so a little bit of background on myself. Uh, so I think I, probably everybody here does know me, I think. <laughs> but anyway, um, so I've been coaching hurdles since the 1990s. Uh, I think 94 is the first year that I started. And since then, I've just been picking it up, picking it up, picking it up and figure it out, figure it out, figure it out. Um, and in my journey in the hurdles, uh, started uh, the, the Nehemiah connection started in, in, in the very beginning. Um, if I was a big basketball, in a big basketball family. And um, I didn't really think of track as, something, as more than something to do during, during the spring as a break from basketball. And then it was my um, it was my it was my my junior year of high school when I saw a, a clip of a video of the race in Zurich, the twelve ninety three, and I was so blown away. I was like, <laughs> it was in my coach's my coach's office. I was watching it, and I was like, Coach, how do I learn how to do that? <laughs> and I I never learned how to do that, but. <laughs> <laughs> that was the beginning of the journey. Um, and so in, um, uh, I guess it was, I guess it was college. Yeah, my first year of college, I, I came across a big, a big, huge volume called the Track and Field Omni book. This book right here, I still have it from 1984. <laughs> Uh, and there's in the hurdle section, there's an interview with Ronaldo with John Hendershot from the Track and Field News. And there's also um, an explanation of, of his training from, from when he was with, with, with Coach Paquette in uh, Scotch Plains. And so I read that like it was, like it was gospel. <laughs> and just tried to keep figuring things out from there. And so, Ironically, Gene Poquette was a mentor of mine before we ever met, <laughs> before I ever knew who he was from having read that section in the Track and Field Omni book. Um, and then, you know, he keeps going on and on. And as I keep trying to figure things out in terms of how to, how to hurdle more efficiently, more fluidly, and more proficiently uh, in my life as a coach, I always keep coming back to Nehemiah, despite the fact that there's been so many innovations and you know great hurdlers after after his career ended uh to me he's still the gold standard of of what it looks like to be you know literally poetry in motion um, so there's that <laughs> uh so let me go ahead and introduce ronaldo uh um, he is uh part of what inspired me to want to write a book about him uh i'm glad so glad he agreed, agreed to the project is you know, I like people who who inspire people. And um, before be, before I knew who he was on a personal level, uh, I could tell he was a special person because when I was a, when I was nobody, <laughs> pretty much back in 2004, and um, I interviewed interviewed Coach P Poquette for my website. I asked I asked Coach. Uh, you think Ronaldo would mind uh, an interview? <laughs> and I was soon as he could be like, "Ah, right, get out of here with that." <laughs> and and uh, coach asked asked him, and like a couple days later, he said, "Yeah, get, here's his number. Give him a call." Um, and that's, that's a, to me, that's kind of that's the kind of guy Ronaldo is. He doesn't he doesn't care about your status. He doesn't care about what you've accomplished. He cares about who you are as a person. And he's a very giving person. And so, um, when I did interview him, he he, he spoke of something that spoke to my heart. Uh, which was hurling as an art form, which is something I always thought of myself, but always pushing the back because I never heard anybody else talk about it. So when I heard him talk about it, I was like, man, if the best whoever did it is talking about it as, as an art form, maybe I'm onto something here. And that really helped to define my coaching career. And um, I pass it on to everybody I coach, whether it's directly talking about it or whether it's um, indirectly through how I coach. Um, so yeah, um, and then also on the call is Gene Poquette, uh, Ronaldo's coach from uh, his high school days and off and on all the way through his, his professional career. And again, Gene um, was a mentor of mine before he knew he was, 
and also um, I'll never forget the one time that uh, uh, my coaching partner and I at the time back in 2005 went to visit Gene at his, at his, uh, in, in Brevard where he used to live, Brevard, North Carolina. And um, we brought one of our athletes with us and Gene coached him for, for a session. And <laughs> watching Gene coach in person was not only inspiring, but I, I just soaked it all in and took it home with me. And so, um, you know, the, the, the energy, the creativity, the, the willingness to take risks, all, or all stuff that I learned from Gene. Uh, that, that kind of validated the path I wanted to take. Okay. Um, all right, so, so, so Joe Gucci, a, a teammate of Ronaldo's from high school, is also on the call. Glad Joe could make it, and I'm sure he can you know, provide much input regarding the high school training as we talk about it. All right. All right. All right let's get to the questions. Um, hold on. <laughs> Get my tabs. Um, before we get started, my name is not Lynn Lochner Nehemiah. <laughs> <laughs> she, shared her screen, she shared her screen with me on a Zoom call, and I guess it, it's the one that it's her. But it's my computer, and this is me. I don't have any other kind of thing going on here. <laughs> well, it's, it's, never mind. <laughs> All right. So. <laughs> We can tell by the face, it's not your wife. <laughs> All right. Um, I got somebody trying to get in and they don't have the link. Hold on. <laughs> Let me ask my first question first. All right. So, first thing I want to start with, Ronaldo, would be um, your. Where is. Okay, gallery. Uh, your, uh, your inspiration. So. I know like you started hurdling in ninth grade and um, where you lived in Scotch Plains, ninth grade was still middle school, what we called junior high back in the day. Um, so that's before you got with Gene. Uh, so tell me what influenced you to want to try it and um, your ninth grade coach, how he, how he worked with you and helped developing uh, your love and your talent. Well, thanks, uh, first of all, for, for having me, and I'm so grateful that uh, others uh, thought the conversation worthy to join as well. Um, as I've told everyone, uh, I grew up uh, in Scotch Plains, and we lived on a corner, and we had a split rail fence, and I spent many a day, like any kid, running and jumping over this fence all the time, you know, just thinking it was cool I could run and jump the fence and not fall down and you know, get away from where it was chasing me. And uh, it wasn't until I think it was 1972 uh, or so when I saw uh, the Olympics and Rod Milburn running. And this guy is running and jumping over what I thought were fences at the time. I didn't know the formal name of them were hurdles. And my immediate response is, man, I can do that. I do that all the time. And so that was the impetus for putting the image of what I thought was pretty cool in my mind. And then when I went into uh, junior high school, ninth grade was still the, the highest grade in junior, uh, in middle school, but junior high school. Um, and trying out for the track team, nobody wanted to hurdle. He asked who wanted to hurdle, no one raised their hand. I felt kind of special because I was the only one to raise my hand and that in and of itself started me on you know, a journey that I never knew would go the way it did. So it was mainly uh, the fascination, the curiosity, the dare to be daring, if you will, at that point. And yeah, and then a guy who, you know, complimented me along the way uh, and was very uh, encouraging. I wasn't anything to write home about in ninth grade, but uh, Coach Samos was very encouraging. Cool. Um, talk a little bit more about Milburn, uh, because I'm a little too young to remember all those guys, but I, but just knowing the history, there was there was before him there was Willie Davenport, and then during his time there was Thomas Hill. Um, yeah, Guy Drew, all Drew, these guys, the, um, French, the Frenchman. Yeah. Uh, what stood out to you about Milburn that made you say, "Whoa, he's doing something different." Well, you know, Milburn had a unique hairstyle. He had a part in the middle of his head. 
<laughs> so that's the first thing. He had an afro with a part down the middle. And I basically took on that part. <laughs> and, and it wasn't all the way in the middle of my head, it was just in the front. But that was my little version of Junior Rod Milburn. Um, he was powerful, he was fast. I was always fascinated how, how two people, three people, four people could go over the hurdle at the same time. But that one person got off the hurdle first. And I thought that was kind of special and unique ability. Uh, and he was fast. You know, the hurdles are the symbol of, of track and field, you know, uh, balance, speed, uh, you know, total athleticism. And so um, I always thought, man, this guy must be pretty talented to be able to run and keep his balance. And, and he wasn't the tallest hurdler out there. And that's the other thing right. uh, that impressed me. It wasn't so much his size. It, you know, it, it seemed that, you know, he had a, an athletic prowess and a determination about him that set him aside from everyone else. And then he had, he exuded this confidence. Uh, Rod Milburn, as you know, Steve, uh, through your research of him, was a very quiet, uh, you know, person. Yeah. Um, and his running did his talk. And even when he was really at the peak of his game, he was still understated as an athlete. And uh, so I like that too, the, the quiet confidence, but yet uh, the assuredness of who he knew he was and, and what he was trying to accomplish as far as being the best athlete he could be. And so throughout my entire career as a, as a, as a youngster, you know, I would take pieces of athletes from a variety of sports uh, uh, characteristics that I kind of you know wanted to have a piece of them within me that represented me um, I, I was never I don't think I was arrogant I may have you know carried myself that way in my presence on the track but I don't think I was verbally arrogant and I and I did have a respect for my competitors but yet I had this um, well when you run into a, a, a Jean Poquette in, in high school and Gene almost dares you to, to prove him wrong <laughs> and you don't want to prove him wrong and then as you go along the way and things are starting to happen um, you start believing that you know one plus one does equal two mm -hmm. and if you do it in that process and build the, the foundational blocks the way Gene was teaching me uh, within the hurdles and within training uh, the, the end result was unimaginable success. I mean, I think it may have surprised, at least surprised me at times. It may not have surprised Gene, but it did surprise me because I was a student and you know his eyes were seeing what I was doing and I was just trying to do what he was asking me to do. Right, right. Gene, let me ask you, what did you first see in Ronaldo that stood out to you um, this kid's going to be special. There was a junior high meet up at the high school track. And uh, I saw this guy about, what, five, six and a half at the time. <laughs> and um, he was three step in the hurdles. It's, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're familiar with junior high runners who generally don't have the same coaching, uh, people as in let's say in the high school level although there have been a couple uh you you know you don't see high, junior high hurdlers three-stepping right and it and it looked totally natural and he was just running away from everybody <laughs> so all i did was i filed in the back of my mind you know we're going to hook up next year and uh and then i forgot about it after that until the time came <laughs> First impression was he's three stepping. You don't, nobody taught him that. It, it came from him. It came from part of it was, was his extreme competitiveness. All right. Now, I don't, Ronaldo, I don't know how surprised he was when he realized he was three stepping. But, you know, once he did it, he just kept doing it. So. And uh, this, was, this was the same spacing and height as the high school hurdles? Yeah, I mean, I, I had, pardon? Were the, were the hurdles 39 inches and? In yeah. Senior? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I don't think they go lower for the junior high. No. Okay. The interesting thing is that uh, Coach Thomas, um, 
like I said, he was a great encourager, but he, he never told me how to do any of that. He just said, let my legs flow and <laughs> you can three step. And I didn't know what that was because I hadn't seen it. No one else on the team was hurdling but me. And uh, I remember the first time I did it through adrenaline, I did it for probably about five hurdles. And I was tickled pink that I was three stepping. And then I realized what I was doing and I went to five steps. You know? <laughs> and then I three stepped the last two hurdles. So, it, you know, that was my first experience three stepping. And then uh, uh, I remember up on the high school track, yeah, I was. By that time, I had uh, enough confidence to know and expect to three-step. Yeah. All right, awesome. Let's talk about these workouts. Um, I guess we're I guess we're I guess we're skipping ahead to junior year. I guess when you because you had injured your sophomore year. So I guess we're skipping ahead to your junior year. Um, so the the legendary workout is the back and forth workout that everybody is probably familiar with and has borrowed to, in some shape or form or another. Um, do you remember your introduction to that workout <laughs> and your, your initial response the first time you did it? Well, you can never forget it. <laughs> if, uh, if you talk the right way with, uh, with Coach Fulton. Okay. Um, so the, the back and forth, which gets a lot of the credit, Gene, you can chime in here. Um, yeah. Everything, uh, everything that we did uh, amounted to like two miles. I mean, I, I started training with the middle distance guys, with Joe and all these guys. So, you know, 24 200s, those kind of things. Uh, eight to 12, 400s, whatever it was. But, you know, and trying to jog in between the intervals, I would walk diagonally across the, the track to meet up with the middle distance guys. Um, so that mindset, parallel the mindset of the hurdles. So the back and forth, you know, the 200, 300 hurdles and 60 yards each way. So 120 yards mm -hmm. and sets of 10. You know, we worked up to 10. I don't think we started right out with 10. We may have. Uh -huh. um, and then the emphasis on the back and forth wasn't just the volume, but it was also uh, you had to have your, you had to have presence of mind what you were doing. So it was a, it was a, a technique workout or an endurance workout but gene was not going to let me uh get lazy over the event you know he didn't want me to practice bad habits and i had to be in the right position and it was extremely taxing mm -hmm. and gene watched the entire workout <laughs> so it wasn't any cutting corners and, and it was it was probably harder than the the, the you know 24 200s and all those other things because mm -hmm. it was so physical mm -hmm. but um Gene's mantra for me was that I was going to be the best conditioned hurdler out there. And uh, so it would not ever be because of a lack of conditioning. And so once I bought into that concept, I think it wasn't as hard to get me to, to buy into the others. And then obviously as you get results from that, you know, you, you embrace it even more. Oh yeah. Is that, is that how you, is that how I received it, Gene? Yeah, I think so. Um... Remember, Ronaldo uh, came up in his sophomore year, but effectively, with an, a very early season injury in a shuttle hurdle relay race, he was done for the season. So we were faced with whatever we could accomplish in his junior and senior year. Okay, um, it, when, when you're first learning how to hurdle and you're trying to master the different aspects of it, the lead leg first get that down before anything then you can go to the trail leg and put it together don't don't try to teach everything all at once because you're not going to master any of it well when you're spending your junior year becoming mechanically sound there's a little bit of a sacrifice in conditioning okay so when i came up with the back and forth idea i figured there's no way you're going to be able to do this and not condition at the same time. Okay. Uh, we did it what twice a week, Ronaldo? Yeah, twice Maybe a week. Maybe a Tuesday yeah. and a Friday or a Monday and a Thursday or something like that. Oops. So it was one rest day, but then the other days were uh, 220s, whatever, ladders, sets of things. 
uh, and uh, I, I guess he started out initially maybe doing four or five in a set. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's no way where you, you start with 10. I, some people never achieve I, 10 once. Coach, uh, and, I and over workout. time, pardon? I have a workout from May 18th, 1977, if you want it. Go ahead. <laughs> that was three, it was two, it was a one to two mile warm up, two by one, 10, 110 yards strides three by it looks like three by three by 220 with a 220 yard bounce walk recovery and then a 440 bounce after each set my times i'm showing 26 27 two were about 30 to 32 so there was a question there on the recovery so it was again this was a little bit later in the season uh but i that was probably one we we did a workout together I don't think I was doing that with Mikowski or anybody else. Um, it was with uh, hurdlers and sprinters. So there was a question there on the recovery. So that was just one that I, I have. Okay. Um, that was so nine. Anyway, I'm sorry. Uh, so anyway, um, uniquely the back and forth permit you to master the mechanics. And at the same time, um, it's one hell of a conditioner. That's all I can say. <laughs> and 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 when you get to the point, I mean, what do we do? At least three three sets. Mm -hmm. So if we started with sets of five to a set to a set, then we did three fives. Well, that's fifty, a hundred, a hundred and fifty just starting out. And you work up to the point where if you're doing three sets of ten, you're doing three hundred hurdles. And you're not doing three hundred hurdles any old way. I mean, the minute you start going bad, you just stop because then you're going to just practice your errors, you know, and what you'll do is you become an expert at the errors and not at the doing it the proper way. So it, it, it served two purposes. Um, I guess it's one of the most strenuous workouts you ever had to go through. Did you? Yeah, I, I, I loved and hated it at the same time. Yeah. Um, I love, obviously, after I started seeing how strong I was getting, but it, it was painful. It was extremely painful. Uh, Gene was a stickler for, for being as perfect as I could, practicing the right habits. He would not let me practice bad habits. Um, you know, I had to be in attack mode over the hurdles, you know. Um, too easy off the hurdle and three attacking into the hurdle, three easy off, but I had to be in position, hips in position. And if I started floating, getting long or rotating, you know, we would stop because I had to be mentally uh, focused. And if, if I wasn't mentally focused, then everything else didn't even really matter. But um, so it took some time really to build up the stamina, as he said, up to three uh, sets of 10, but just 150 are tough, especially if you're doing them the way he wants you to do them. And then you're going uh, 60 yards each direction. So that's 120 yards for one pass. So, you know, you're doing what, 500, 600 yards on five passes, you know, and, uh, or 700, whatever that is. <laughs> and that's rough for, for a sprinter sprinter. And, um, but I did it, you know, it's one of these things where, you know, you look at them sideways and you're going, you know, is he winging this? What is this? And, uh, but you do it because I didn't want to not do it and not reap the benefits because then I couldn't blame him. I have to blame me. And my mentality was always, I never wanted to blame someone else. So I would do it, whatever it took. And then if it didn't happen, then it was on me. So, uh, and then throughout the whole process, Gene, I think we experimented with a lot of different ways to train mm -hmm. uh, to get me to respond differently, to build on different things. Mm -hmm. uh, there wasn't any any real true manual that we followed. I think we, we created our own, Gene, mm -hmm. you know? I agree. Yeah. Was there anybody else that you trained with or anybody else that you coached, Gene, who could come near that kind of volume? And As a hurdler? No. In, in the back and forth workout as a hurdler, yeah. Oh, um, actually, 
uh, the, the back and forth maybe started even back when um, in 1968 oh. and I had a pole vaulter by the name of Scott Curley who uh, at that time broke the state record I think it was 13 8 and then three quarters or something like that but because a lot of these pole vaulters are really such good athletes too he hurdled and he wasn't real fast but he was very athletic and willing to work mm -hmm. and I remember we did some back up, back and forth maybe just to get a little stronger because most of his time was spent pole vaulting but he would like win the hurdles in the watch on conference in, in a conference meet or something like that but I really remembered it in 19 before 75, 75, 76. And then I realized that in his junior year, we couldn't spend as much time on conditioning as I would have liked to, because that extra time conditioning was going to take away from mastering the mechanics. All right. Mm -hmm. But it was the, the absolute best thing you could achieve if you want to get the mechanics down and some degree of conditioning. Mm -hmm. As it turned out, we carry that forward over into a senior year, uh, because later on you might want to talk about it. But you know, I'm not a great believer in in speed. Hmm. You know, speed work to us ended up being jamming. Um, speed work was changing his cadence between hurdles, not speed work in the sense that a sprinter does speed work. Mm -hmm. Speed work even was a tin, uh, had a tinge of conditioning because a, a speed work in late season before the big meets would be to run a, a, a 23-200, take a 30-second break, and then match it with another 23-200, <laughs> and then go walk a lap and do that three times. Mm. Now that's, to me, that's speed work, but it's speed work based on conditioning, but you can only do it after the conditioning. So. Mm -hmm. I think it's 85% strength work, 15% speed work, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, I was I was listening, I was reading an article, um, I was reading an article recently that appeared in Trek and Field News, uh, talking about Ronaldo and Greg Foster. Did you ever see that, Ronaldo? It was a pretty, pretty good article. It's somewhat okay. recent, last couple of months. If not, I'll send it to you. Okay. Um, but what Ronaldo said, and he was talking about when he ran the 15, uh, the, th the 13, 15, was mm -hmm. the first world record? 16, uh, yep, 13, 16. 13, 16, yeah. And, and you mentioned, first of all, that was the one you didn't want to even go out, run D.D. Cooper or something like that. Correct. So you went out there and you broke the world record. And the one comment that stuck with me is that you haven't that you didn't ever get around to doing any speed work yet. Right. So you broke the world record basically off of strength and your character as a competitor. All right, because what did you run when did you run the 15? The next week? I ran 13 flat the next week. Yeah. So you ran you broke two world records. And I mean, how much speed work can you get done? between the two weeks. <laughs> you broke those two world records with only a background of strength to some extent, I think. Yeah, we had come off indoors and it was spring break. Right. And we were going out to San Jose for spring break and partake in a Bruce Jenner meet. So I hadn't really done any speed work outside of my indoor season. Right. And I was running the race thing and I was running against nobody. And then there's Dee Dee Cooper, a world-class hurdler there. And I guess, as Gene said, it was definitely pride because I did not want to lose. I thought I was being set up. I was angry, but I didn't think in my wildest dreams I could run 13, 16. And uh, so, yeah, I ran 13, 16 through competitiveness. Uh, just, I, I think also Gene, just innate ability and, and know-how, you know, and then, you know, you got to travel back east for a couple of days and turn around and fly all the way back to UCLA and I ran 13 flat. So definitely didn't have enough time to, to, to make up conditioning 
in those few days. Yeah. Wow. So in terms of in terms of speed speed work, mentioned it is actually this for for some of the coaches. Um, can you can you explain what? Because uh, Joe mentioned like the bounce in between reps. Can you can you explain what that bounce consists of? Like if you're doing 200 and then you bounce to 200, what does that bounce consist of? Well, being up here in Rhode Island and, and watching a lot of high school training somewhat recently, it seems they like to, to, to run something and then walk, and then run something and then walk. And to me, uh, the only time you should walk is between sets, not between efforts in a set because there's a difference in your body when you stop and walk or if you're still imitating the running motion a little bit so it's 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 really it's not a jog too fast it's a bounce so it's a form of recovery but there's a difference between bouncing the ankle the feet coming up on the toes lifting the knees a little bit that kind of thing as opposed to just stopping and walking and then starting and running Mm -hmm. uh, and that was with all my runners. Mm -hmm. Joe will tell you because mm -hmm. it didn't matter what event you were with. It, it was we, also didn't count, we didn't count that jogging as any of the distance. Right. The only when when Ronaldo said two miles to work out more for the distance runners, that, that was only the, the the two miles of the timed effort. Mm -hmm. Jogging was just part of your recovery. It didn't count. So if you jog, if you bounced rather a two hundred, that was a two hundred more. <laughs> the the bounce was a time for quiet prayer that the workout would <laughs> be over soon. Uh, I agree. Get, get, help me through this, Lord. Get me through this, especially those one minute, two minute recoveries after the two twenties. Every spring, every year, sophomore year through senior year was April, third week in April, and we have temperature in the 70s and we always do that workout but like Gene was saying that's I did that in college it was something you you just don't stop you and your heart rate is up a little bit right it stays up but it's coming down and then you're ready to go again and uh, I think physiologically and mentally it's uh, it was a good way to recover you know and then go to your next one yeah, it, it also ultimately uh, enabled me to uh, embrace fatigue or, or the pain without falling apart because I was familiar with that feeling. Right. You know, you've never had that feeling, you know, you panic and you fall apart. Yeah. Uh, but through weeks and months of doing it, uh, I knew what it felt like. I knew I could make it through it. And so in the race, even if I felt somewhat tired it didn't affect me psychologically or physiologically because i had been there before mm -hmm. because of the preparation and, and training and i think that's and i was able to maintain my form throughout the race without falling apart you see a lot of guys certain yeah. parts will fall <laughs> apart because they're not physically able to maintain that high intensity um, but i could um, and and as gene said gene let me run one hundred meter 100 yard dash uh, <laughs> my entire time in high school. I begged him and because he would never let me sprint ever. Sprinting was the jamming session, you know. And well, it was almost as bad as playing two on two basketball. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and we avoided that. That's a sore In up. high school. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he let me run one time uh, the 100 yard dash and, and I had to basically try to promise him I wouldn't get hurt because he would have never forgiven me for doing that because <laughs> he didn't subscribe to it. And, uh, but yeah, he said, he's right. 85% was all strength. And it was one of those things where I would go to a race believing in my heart that there was not another hurdler on the track that was as fit and as strong mm. and who would even attempt to do the, the, the types of workouts we were doing. Right, yeah. right. Um, he mentioned that race. Can I just enlarge it up on it a little bit? Sure. Um, the next town, Westfield, had two sprinters, uh, Kelly and uh, Butch. Well, yeah. And Butch was a, 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 a high school state champ football player and an All-American at, at uh, 
Michigan, and he played for the Giants in that. Yeah, yeah, I know you're talking about that. And I guess the families in both towns, the fathers of the kids in that, and the uncles, they all jammered about, man, who could win between Butch and Ronaldo? And there was a lot of that going on. Um, and to be very selfish, um, it was also an opportunity to win the Union County Championships. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so rather than, I mean, he could, he could run, he could run a 13-6 high hurdle race at half speed from my point of view. So uh, he ran the high hurdles, the 100 and the, then it was the 220. Right. And he long jumped, which we'll come to later. <laughs> He long jump well, once or twice. Once you, you saw that the guy in second place would never catch you, then you just didn't jump anymore. Right. He ran just fast enough to win the hurdles without, because we were 100 and, and the, uh, the 220. Uh, do you remember what good times in the 100 yard dash is as opposed to the 100 meters? Because I had three state champs. Two of them ran 9.8 and one of them ran 9.7. And the two that ran nine eight, the two kids, they also won the two twenty in the states. Mm -hmm. This guy gets to the finals and he runs nine four. <laughs> All right. That would be about a two. What Butch ran nine six or something like that. And then he goes to the two twenty on a turn, and he runs twenty point eight. Now these are fantastic high school times. Um, they still wouldn't. Really we could do it. <laughs> Can you imagine having the best hurdler in the country and he pulls a muscle because he's running some dinky hundred yard dash that doesn't mean anything? <laughs> I mean, I thought it was more challenging to, to, to run at college heights while you're running against the high schoolers at the 39 inches. Yeah. So, you know. As this progresses, we'll talk a little bit more about some things. Some of my best times as a coach have been in practice, not at meets, mm -hmm. quite honestly. Mm -hmm. uh, when you see some of the things that, that these guys can do, yeah. um, if they, you know, they, they dedicate themselves to it. So, yeah. uh, how about never having long jump in your life? Never been on a long jump runway and you break a 44 year old state record? <laughs> And the guy that had it was the major competitor of Jesse Owens, who the 10 times he competed with Owens, he beat him seven times. Mm. But he was hamstrung for the 36 Olympics. So Ronaldo, we, what was it? Corny relays, I had one other kid that was long jumping and I didn't want to leave him home because it was a relay meet, so it was a two man relay. <laughs> so what, we got, to the, we got to the track and you stood on the runway and said, okay, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I mean, really? <laughs> so I said, go down to the takeoff board, and I'll stand at the, the beginning of the runway and run four steps half speed, four steps three quarter speed, eight steps full speed, run as fast as you can, then when you get to the board, jump as high as you can. <laughs> that was the coaching. <laughs> All right? Believe me. And he jumps 24, 11 and a half. <laughs> Wow. And then, and then that article I sent you, and then Ed Grant said, yeah, and then he never long jumped again. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, about that count, that, that Union County meet, Joe, mm -hmm. you sent yeah. me the meet results from the states, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it showed where you were the, the Union County champ in the 800. But what yeah. it did, it listed Kelly is winning the 100, or bet Kelly is winning the 100, Butchie as winning the 220, which wasn't true, and Ronaldo winning the intermediates, which he never ran. <laughs> so I stopped looking for results from articles. Really? Yeah. I, yeah. I have. I have. I have the art. Actually, I have an article on that. We ran the mile relay too. Yeah. But yeah. It, anyway. It always comes down to the mile relay. Yeah. Yeah. Let's back up a bit. Uh, you mentioned the jamming workout a couple of times. Can you explain to the coaches in the room uh, what that workout entailed and why both of you feel that that was a good replacement for like, what, we, what we call speed work? 
Well, it was a rhythm race and uh, a rhythm workout. And Gene uh, wanted me to, to sprint, you know, and- I wanted, I, I wanted you to change your cadence. Right. Which is, which is rhythm. We're right. saying the same thing. Same thing. You're right. saying rhythm, I'm saying cadence. <laughs> and we wanted you to increase your cadence. There's two ways of doing. One is stand on the side as a coach and yell faster, faster. That never worked for me. <laughs> Okay, so we had to do something specific. And the way it came about was when we went to the Penn Relays, you ran the 46.5 anchor leg. I got in a conversation with Jim Tuppany. And I said, you know, I've got this wonderful runner. He's tied the indoor national record a couple of times. And we just can't get that extra hundredth of a second or whatever it was to break it. And he said, well, bring the hurdles closer together and make them in between. And I thought about it and I said, well, yeah, because he's going to have to change his cadence. He's going to have to go from a slower cadence, rhythm, to a faster one. Mm -hmm. And that's how that really all began. Mm -hmm. And that was really most of our speed work, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how far in did you bring them? Pardon? How, how close together did you bring the hurdles? We started out with what, eight and a half? Eight and a half. At first. But then as he got better and bigger and longer, then that was a little bit too close. And then gradually went up to nine and maybe even nine and a half. Nine and a half. Right? Right. Yeah. And it was always, you know, it was the shuffling that they call it today, the spread mm -hmm. of the shuffle. We didn't have, the, have those terms at the time, but that's what was causing me to get my legs and feet to turn mm -hmm. over. Yeah. Uh, quicker, the rhythm quicker, a faster rhythm. Um, back then, I mean, we didn't have those kind of terms, but you know, right. we had to. G needed to generate more, more quickness and speed out of me in between the hurdles. Right. And so that that exercise in and of itself did it. And as I got more proficient with it, we we had to space them out because we also didn't want me to start backing off right. on the hurdles because you're getting so close. Uh, and that's another thing, even with the jamming, uh, Gene watched my technique, mm -hmm. you know, because didn't want to ingrain muscle memory the wrong way. Mm -hmm. uh, and let me just jump in. But then I think I've he heard you talk in the past, or they wrote about what you said in the past. And you said one of the things, and I'll, we'll attribute it to maybe partly to this workout, but your ability to know when you were going a little bit too quick or whatever and make little adjustments right in the middle of a race mm -hmm. rather than just do what you've been practicing you, you could you saw yourself coming up too fast you knew enough to make some little change so you didn't pay the price yeah i learned very early without truly knowing i guess it was just a, a gift i had is that I realized that there, I was generating varying speeds as I went along. So as I, as I got faster from two to three to four to five, uh, things were happening in between. I was losing distance or, you know, I didn't have the same amount of distance equally because I was getting faster and stronger. And so I'd have to make subtle adjustments uh, with my body. Um, I guess I had a, you know, I was gifted with flexibility. So was, that was another reason why I was able to do it. I was pretty flexible and nimble. But um, yeah, there were many times where, and Gene knows because my, uh, my junior year um, at the Eastern States, when the first time I ever fully experienced sprinting in the race over hurdles, I fell down. Remember that Gene? No, that was the only race in high school that I never attended. Okay. You yeah. went with Charlie Waters. Charlie Waters. Oh, I blamed it on Charlie, not me. Yeah. <laughs> no. But I was running against these guys, and something happened from hurdle three that I was, like, I just took off. It was the first time that I ever was really sprinting in the hurt. You know, it wasn't like a fast one, two, three. It was quicker, quick. And it was, I was moving so fast that I was getting so overly rotated that I couldn't, you know, couldn't pull back, nor did I want to. 
and I crashed number eight, I think, and fell down. But I was laughing when I fell down because I was so happy <laughs> that I finally knew what it felt like to sprint in between the hurdles. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, running to uh, Mr. Waters who had this blanket look on his face and I said, I did it. I did it for the first time. I can't believe I was sprinting over the hurdles. And I waited to that next year. You know, I just was salivating to come back to that year. And, you know, obviously it, it was a historical day because I ran 13, one, 13 flat, 12, nine, the, the next year at that same event. But that was, I believe my true coming out where I really became mm -hmm. that next great hurdler in the making. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when I experienced for the first time, my body really accepting what Gene had been teaching me all this time and staying in there, not ducking out and embracing the speed. And um, yeah, it was a beautiful thing, even though I fell down, but I was laughing because I knew why I fell down. And it was one of those times where I could accept it because it was a teachable moment, but it was positive. Yeah, you kind of had a breakthrough. This yeah, time, if I could exactly. Yeah. Let me ask you this, um, for someone, let's say in 13s, elite level hurdlers, or on their way to elite level hurdlers, do you feel like the kind of speed work that is, that is kind of the norm now, where you're really driving, you know, all out over 30 meters, 40 meters, 50 meters, do you think that that's counterproductive for a hurdler who has to always quicken it up? Well, the mindset for everyone today, most hurdlers would never even fathom doing the type of workouts we did. <laughs> they just don't. They, they train 100 meters, 150 meters, 200 meters. Uh, everything is speed. They have uh, the advancement of uh, the synthetic track technology you know, to their advantage. They have lighter hurdles than yeah. we had. So they're, le they're more aggressive because there's less penalty, physical penalty. We had physical penalty, penalties, <laughs> pieces of meat on the, the hurdle crossbar. Um, so many of them, uh, with those factors, it's a full-time sport, right? So they, they're full-time professional athletes. So they have, you know, they, there's so many different training methodologies. There's massage therapy, there's nutrition. So it's all working to their advantage. Mm -hmm. Obviously over, over the years, you know, bigger, faster, stronger. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a natural, uh, evolutionary process. Um, for instance, I just left Mark Miramar yesterday and Grant Holloway, who ran 729 for the world record. Man, what's that something? Yeah. Um, now, if you do that math, 729 should almost be 1270 something. Yeah. You know? right. But um, he's still a great hurdler, but I've even had conversations where Grant doesn't transfer his speed evenly. So he uses up a lot of his speed in the first five. Mm -hmm. And then he's dying holding on, running 13 0, 13 ones. Mm -hmm. Well, I, he doesn't need to run thir uh, 729, 730 pace. He can run 740 pace and distribute the energy more mm -hmm. evenly, and he'd have more at the end of the race. Right. He's very raggedy his last four mm -hmm. because he's almost out of gas after five. Mm -hmm. And so, but that's the mindset of a lot of college athletics now is that everything is speed, 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 speed. And you only have so many of those in your body in a given season. So, uh, you know, he's, yeah, there are many good hurdlers. There's so many that there are more that have run in the 13, but they don't do it consistently only because they've forgotten the technique. Mm -hmm. Everything is speed and power. But at the end of the day, you have to get over the obstacle. Right. And if you're gonna, you know, if you're running into something three or four times, you're talking a race that's hundreds of seconds. You know, that's gonna hurt you. So um, we still haven't seen that. Although we'll have, you know, a hurdler here and there who runs fast, but they may not necessarily display the art form that we're talking about. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, let's talk about your technique. Um, I know when I interviewed Gene back in 2005, he used the word unitize in regards to the lead leg and trail leg, which is not in the dictionary. So it's a word that, it's a word that he created. <laughs> um, 
Can you explain to you what that means and like for the coaches on the call, what that meant for you in terms of when you're moving at full speed? It was almost, not almost, it was one continuous motion. Mm -hmm. You know, for every action is a reaction. So we, as Gene said, we, we mastered all of the components, lead leg, trail leg, lead arm, trail arm, independently. And then we learned them to work together in tandem. So um, in unitizing the lead leg, I'd have to activate the trail leg as soon as the lead leg was attacking. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't two different motions because then that would open you up or your body has to wait for the other part. Yeah. So, so it takes a lot of strength in your adductors and your groin and your, ab and your abs and in your arms. You know, a lot of hurdlers, you know, they're leg hurdlers, they're not, they're not using all the limbs. And so we were working all, and in order to unitize, my arms have to help my legs, but then my mind had to tell myself the minute my trail leg left the ground, it had to keep moving. Mm -hmm. Couldn't wait and be pulled over. It had to work in unison, in unison with my lead leg. Right. So Gene's term was unitization, unitize the two of them, which I knew it's like, it had to go right away. And so when I was doing the back and forth drills in particular, he'd watch and he could, he would tell me if, if I wasn't unitizing and they were just two, two separate components. And we weren't trying to work that, um, we, and I was also taught that the lead leg was the most important leg. A lot of hurdlers today think it's a trail leg, but the lead leg initiates everything. Mm -hmm. So for us, uh, as important as the lead leg was, the trail leg couldn't get left behind. Mm -hmm. It had to work in unison. So it had to be active as the lead leg was active. Yeah. Yeah, we even try to imagine that we could get your trail leg to hit the ground about the same time. As same time. <laughs> <laughs> Which of course you don't, but um, yeah. Another thing, Steve, I, we said unitize, and, and Steve, when he's working with his hurdlers, he, he also uses the analogy of imagine you're on a bicycle. Right. And it's click, 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 click. And when you're bicycling, neither leg ever stops. It just keeps going, keeps going. Right. And when you think about it, that's, that's a pretty good mental concept, too, mm -hmm. of not having any leg wait for another leg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was I was talking to a hurdler yesterday after the meet, he showed me his race again and we we're talking and I watched his race and because he wasn't unitizing, uh, he was opening up, I'll show it this way. So this is the apex of the hurdle. Instead of keeping his dive, he was opening up and therefore the hips dropped right. because he wasn't on this side of the apex. He was over the top of the apex and he was opening up prematurely. So I said, yeah, so as you're opening up, weight is, is shifting down. And so even though you're landing like you think you're forward, you're almost vertical. Now you gotta rotate forward to start running again. Yeah. And I said, if you do that 10 times or nine times, look at the time you're losing. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, it's like a series of free falls off of the top of the apex. Mm -hmm. And I said, it, it will throw you forward and you just chase your legs, chase, <laughs> chase that feeling. I said, but you're, you're trying to see the hurdle. So you're, you're opening up like a lot of guys do and you can't feel it, but that's what's happening. The body gravity is pulling it down a little bit and your positioning is changing. Mm -hmm. And I said, that's what happens with so many young hurdlers um, who can run faster, but they have to work so much harder. So I said, so when you get vertical coming down, now you have to use your body and your arms to, to generate new speed yeah. instead of just falling off and, and then chasing your legs like you're going to fall but you won't yeah and uh and i just it's so so when i talk to hurdlers and like my session with gene was like being in a classroom mm -hmm. i mean i had to visualize what he was telling me understand what it would based on his uh his illustration his verbal illustration and then try to make it happen and match it up to what he was saying mm -hmm. and, and get his confirmation of it so many hurdlers today, they're into the clock starts, they run. <laughs> and they're not aware of what they're doing. And you have to be aware of what you're doing in order to make improvements. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, it didn't matter what I was doing in practice. Gene would tell me, you know, if I wasn't doing it right. 
-hmm. And he, you know, we he pulled me to the side and we talk and he show me what the lead leg is supposed to do. He'd emulate the lead leg or he'd emulate the trail leg mm -hmm. and, you know, telling me. And I got to see it enough times that imagery, right. I could visualize it and make it become one. Right. And uh, but a lot of guys and gals too, it's just about speed. Yeah. And like, you have to know where you are, what you're doing in order to perfect your craft. Yeah. And uh, so the, the more of a student you are, the more opportunity you have to advance. Wow, that's pretty cool. Let me ask you this. Um, when, a, when you have hurdlers, like if you have hurdlers who um, kind of back off a little bit because they're afraid of their speed um, or they don't know how to, like, to negotiate that space, um, how do you get them to stay in attack mode because I think some of what I'm hearing is that people standing up and getting more erect as they come down it's like they're trying to control what they're doing and it's like I guess the jamming workout would perhaps would be the answer you got to kind of because you did that on the grass correct um no maybe the first day <laughs> we did but no not really oh you did <laughs> the, only, the only did we thing we did on grass is uh, 45 40, inches. 45 okay, inches. Okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. So, what are you laughing? What are you laughing about? <laughs> we did all kinds of crazy things, but we did. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, go ahead. Um, it, it, in his senior year, the, the, the thing where it really all started, we've never talked about it, Ronaldo and I, but so if I'm wrong or, you know, don't just agree, but I really think the way, the, where it started was we had tied the national record at six, nine, a couple of times. And I, and so what I did is I got him invited into the, uh, the 60 yard open hurdles race with Lily Davenport and, and Charles Foster. Mm -hmm. I forget who got third that night. Um, so if he had finished dead last, everybody would say, well, he's just a high school kid. But he finished fourth. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the Melrose Games invitation 60, okay? And that told us all a lot, you know, because maybe we worked a little bit on 42 inch hurdles beforehand, but not very much. Mm -hmm. So he goes out over 42 inch hurdles coming from high school and he finishes fourth in the Melrose Games. And, and I think uh, maybe even without realizing it, that was a great confidence builder, was for me a great confidence builder. Mm -hmm. And that's what I decided that we're going to make a 42 inch hurdler out of him before college. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and. and Psychologically, I mean, if you're handling 42s, right, and the 30, 39s are, are nothing. Oh, yeah. And when you're in the shape that he's in and with the, the natural speed that he has, then you're not worried about 39 inches. Okay. So we would practice over 42s. Sometimes we'd have him race in a dual meet. He ran the 42s and everybody else ran the 39s. <laughs> Which okay. I was not a fan of. <laughs> Which we're not a fan of. Yeah, no, but, losing didn't yeah, I, well with me. Well, a lot of the things you're not a fan of are the things that really made you <laughs> prove to, to me. <laughs> right? Yeah. And I never asked you to do anything I didn't think you could do. Right. That's true. <laughs> and, and then as we got further down the line, um, the Eastern states proved that. I don't think hurdle height was ever a factor. No. Okay, so by the time we get to the under 20 national championships, he goes and he wins it. And then sometime in what, July? When was the junior Pan Am games? Yeah, July, yeah. In early July, mid-July. He goes and he, and he breaks the world record in the under 20, 42 inches. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, that really all started with the Melrose games. At least my thinking is that way. 
So a lot of the things we did, I mean, if, if you think 30, if you think 42 is your high, because you're used to 30, 39s, you get used to 42s, then the 39, that's really not that much of a barrier. Now how tall? And even you? that stupid going over the 45 inch hurdles, <laughs> that was just to say, well, you see, 42s aren't that high. <laughs> Because 45 is higher and I've done it. So yeah. I don't know, mentally, I think it all plays a role. So by senior year of high school, how tall were you, Ronaldo? Pardon? My senior year, I graduated high school, I was 5'9, five 5'9 nine. Five nine and a half. You were 5'9 going over 42s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Broke the world record. <laughs> the junior going world 40, record. Going over 45s. <laughs> But that was on the grass, and it was a foam top because they were high. <laughs> we wrapped them. Still, <laughs> I want to go back to you talking earlier about you talking about earlier, uh, Ronaldo, about visualizing and and the imagery aspect of things when Gene would talk to you and give you give you some feedback, and you try to visualize it. Because one of the things that I'm that I'm kind of nitpicky about is, and I mentioned this in the other Zoom I did uh, last last month, is that the athlete has to be able to feel what they're doing. Um, and like in you know 21st century, we're all about the iPhone. We're all about a video. We're all about looking at what we did before we do our next rep. And hearing you talk, I kind of feel that I, that my old opinion still stands that you have to be able to feel what you're doing so you can react in those moments when your adrenaline's pumping and you're going faster than you were, than you thought you would or what have you. Um, you have to be able to react. And that starts in practice. What are your thoughts on that? Well, hurdling is a feel race. It's a rhythm race. Uh, we use the word rhythm. Uh, Gene even said, you know, become like a dancer. You know, don't, we didn't fight the hurdle. You know, we, we embraced it. And so, you know, you wanted to be fluid. Um, but the visualization, so if you're telling me something, I would always spend time trying to visualize in my mind what that looked like, mm -hmm. you know? So whatever he said to me, I'd try to see that happening. Mm -hmm. And then I would think about it all night till the next day or whatever. And then when we did it two days later, you know, I would interpret what I thought he was saying right. through the feel and the rhythm. Right. And, uh, and as I started less fighting the hurdle, meaning trying to really get over the top of the hurdle, but just glide over the hurdle, and be more fluid, then I realized that it didn't take as much effort uh, to run the hurdles as it normally would. And, mm -hmm. and so that's that's what a lot of hurdlers do today. They don't they don't feel the rhythm. Mm -hmm. You know, they try to they try to create the uh, the rhythm, and they're fighting against themselves all the time because they're trying to power and. Yeah. Hurling is not really a power race. It's it's a it's a finesse race. It's a it's a speed race, but uh, and it's all it's fl fluidity. Yeah, it really is. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so Gene didn't want me fighting the obstacle. You know, mm -hmm. just embrace it. Try to be a dancer, smooth. A dancer smoothly. Dancer's light on his feet. Right. Um, dancer's ag agile. You know, um, so. That's how I was taught. That's what I believed. And then as I started getting results, you know, you buy into it. I mean, as Gene said, he put me to the test. Um, whether I wanted to do it or not, as I kept getting, having more success on all the different things that I thought I didn't think I wanted to do, I didn't second guess him because I knew I was having success. Yes. So I was like, okay, this is working. I don't know where it's coming from, but it's working. <laughs> Did you bother with touchdown touchdown times at all? Yeah, we did touchdown, did we not, Gene? Yeah, you mean in distance from the hurdle? You know, like one point between the the, the uh, like when we timed ourselves. Yeah. You know, uh, trying to go under. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, that, that was that was yeah. That was kind of speed. What we what we do is I. There'd be no go. I'd start the watch when your lead leg hit the ground coming off the first hurdle. Right. And then we'd go what, a total of five hurdles. Yeah. So then I'd stop it when your lead leg, when your foot hit the ground off the last hurdle. 
Mm-hmm. And then what we try to do with the break is, is, is beat your time every time. Right. Was and, that a regular and, and way of doing something competitively in practice, but you're competing against yourself rather than somebody running alongside of you. So uh, let's say we, we put up five hurdles or six, six hurdles, whatever, five hurdles. Mm-hmm. You, you start going when you want. Uh, how fast you are to that first hurdle, that's your running. There's nobody saying, ready, set, go, and starting the watch then. Uh, start the watch as soon as your lead foot hits the ground off the first. Stop the watch as soon as the lead foot hits the ground off the fifth. Get a time. Mm-hmm. All right? Now, how many times would you do that? Five, six, seven times in right. practice. Mm-hmm. Six, seven, and see if you can't beat your time. Mm. Yeah, and and in doing so, uh, we start establishing consistency. Mm-hmm. You know, which was mm-hmm. far more important. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so that you want erratic in your time. So, and then me trying to beat the times kept me honest because mm-hmm. if I was just running, the times could be anywhere. So once I established that first time, I had to try to match it or beat it, mm-hmm. which kept a competitive edge. And we, you know, obviously we got pretty good at it. You know, yep. we had some pretty good splits. Yeah. So was that a was that a, a regular thing or just during during like the late season? No. Uh, oh. The, we, we, like, we, like, like like timing the the splits. I think I think it was it, it was sporadically throughout the season. Mm-hmm. I mean, once you got in shape. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Ronaldo, you talked about. Well, you were talking to me you were earlier uh, for the book. You talked about um, how you could predict your times like to a tenth uh, a lot of the time when you were in, in, at, at Maryland. Um, mm-hmm. Would you say that this type of training that you did with Gene uh, is what enabled you to do that? Taking that kind of training with you enabled you to be able to be so sure of how fast you were capable of running? Yes, because um, we broke we broke hurdling down in so many different ways, mm-hmm. and so uh, those progressions. So by the time I got to Maryland, I mean I was still doing Gene's workouts at college, mm-hmm. and so I was just becoming uh, far more of a student. And then I was just doing different combinations of what he had had me do, mm-hmm. um, and we- so and I knew. You know, there's a, again, it's a rhythm race, it's a field race. So, you know, when Gene would time me on a touchdown to touchdown, I felt the intensity of the time that I was running and what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And so if I could replicate that feel, I was either pretty close or surpassing the time I had just done. Mm-hmm. So every, I was always chasing a feel. Right. Cause if I felt a certain way, then I knew that I was running. And in order to do that, I had to, you know, be in the right position over the hurdle and be smooth and keep my balance and everything that he told me unitizing and really attack. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when that happens, you can feel the speed that's coming with you. You know, there's there's an increase of speed because you're generating more speed as you go. And so that feel, I couldn't tell you the time, but I always say, I bet that was faster. Mm -hmm. And you know, nine times out of 10, it would be faster. Mm -hmm. So I, I can always tell when I was putting forth, you know, a better effort Right. And I like that because then that gave me a purpose, you know, um, as I got older, and especially, you know, when I got really, really good, um, I love hurling so much that it had to be purposeful. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember I used to have two watches on me at college because I didn't trust the person with one watch, <laughs> uh, because I just wanted to make sure everybody was honest with the time, uh, because and Gene could tell you that we could tell based on what I was doing in practice, what I should be doing in the meet. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So quantifiably what that would represent. And in college, um, there are many times when I was breaking world records, especially indoors, I was breaking world records in practice. <laughs> and so I came to the meet, not chasing world record, but knowing that if I ran like I just did in practice, I should do okay. Mm-hmm. And right. add adrenaline to it. I would, break world records so Mm -hmm. that's what was happening you know you get control and command over what it is that you're trying to do and you're 
you're so fluid and smooth and, and in charge of your technique and your hip placement. And then you've done the foundational work that Gene taught in me and instilled in me. Mm -hmm. um, that was my pride and joy is that, yes, I was a very good hurdler, but I was fit. <laughs> you know, as you saw when I ran those pin relay splits. So that's all because of my training with Gene yeah. that I was able to do all that. Yeah. What, what we also never did in practice was run a full race with right. a clock for time. We never considered, we never ran like a, well, it was 120 yards then, but 110. We yeah. never put up a flight of hurdles, 10 hurdles at 120 yards in practice and tried to see how fast we could run 120 yards. We always ran parts, 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 knowing that we're going to be strong enough when the time came to put it all together and we're in a competitive situation. And, and that goes true with my runners. We never raced an 800 in practice. Mm -hmm. Guys against it, never raced a 400. Never. Mm -hmm. Ran athletes and timed them at you know their distance in practice to see how we're going to do. We we knew what we were going to do based on how we did with the parts. Mm -hmm. And you just but remember, even when you were a pro, and one of the things we do is we get under the stands, and you you'd run, and I I'd, I'd time you on the way up, and then you'd stop and turn around, and when you ran back, uh, but I would stop to watch as soon as you came off the last hurdle. And then we could pretty much predict how that was working, um, how well you're going to do in the race at that time. Right. Right? Do you remember that? Mm hmm Yeah, there are some times where, yeah, we'd run over five, touchdown over five, get in the blocks on the other side, <laughs> and take off and run five the other way, yeah. and try to match that time or beat that time. And yeah, and we could pretty much tell what my race was going to be. Um, and I think that was your genius, Gene, that, you know, we, we pieced the, the race together in so many different parts. That helped me as far as my first third of the race, the first three hurdles of the race, middle part of the race, the back end of the race. Um, and I just, you know, I got very comfortable with where I needed to be and when I needed to be. And then, you know, when you're studying different uh, as I got older, studying in my competition, I knew where their strengths and weaknesses were. Mm -hmm. So I would train accordingly. So I knew somebody like Foster was a, a, a strong closer. I knew I had to be fit in order to maximize my hurdling gift um, because I didn't want to run someone else's rhythm because uh, you can get into uh, you know rhythm rot where you're, you're both locked in running the same thing. So, yeah. Question for both of you. Do you think, kind of based on what's, what you're saying, do you think that people, coaches, hurdlers, underestimate the fatigue factor in a 110 meter race? Say that again. I was, I was asking. Do they underestimate it? Yeah, he asked if the coaches underestimate the fatigue factor in the hurdle race. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think so. I don't think. I don't think any like high school hurdlers that I know. I don't think any of them are in condition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because if, if if they were truly in condition, just the extra strength. I mean, if the, technically, like your guys, the, the kids you're teaching hurdling and that. Um, so for them, it's a, it's a factor. But mm -hmm. I don't. I don't. Is it a factor internationally? I don't know. I don't think so. I was just trying. I'll just think just because of what Ronaldo said earlier about uh, Holloway, you know, not, not being strong in that last part of the race. Like, do you feel like that's kind of the norm now? That, that everybody's focusing so much on, on, on speed work that they're, they're not strong for a whole flight of ten hurdles. It, it's it's, each of them have different approaches to it, and I and I go to so many races. Uh, most hurdlers, for the most part, think that you know if they win the first five hurdles, they can win the race. Mm. And I'm like, no, because <laughs> if you take, let's just say, for lack of argument, everybody's running 13 flat. They're just going to get there differently, right? Mm. But the person who's in control of their race 
and doesn't press and do other things will win the race. Mm -hmm. And all those other people are trying to make things happen to beat this other person, which is taking them out of their rhythm. Mm -hmm. And then they're tying up their body because it, it, they're using more energy at different points than they should because exactly. they're, they're not in condition. Right. So they get tired sooner. You know, you're, you're 1290, you're, you're 1293. Yeah. Came about in the last three or four hurdles of the race. Right. Mm -hmm. I think up to that point, it was Foster either had a slight edge or you were pretty much even and you ran away from them at the end of the race. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. We're neck and neck and then probably from seven to eight yep. is when I started to make my move. And then right. Got I watched for an hour today, old Nehemiah yeah. hurdle races <laughs> on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. So it was always, so I was very strong and he was a bigger man. So most people think he's bigger, stronger. He should, you know, be the guy. But I always told people, people didn't run me down. Usually I would just run away from them. Um, <laughs> But I also ran my race, you know? So I knew I couldn't win it at five, but I also knew I could put a lot of pressure on them at five because I was already faster than everybody in the world at five. But I didn't run out of control. You know, I was, Gene taught me to stay in control. So I, I didn't know the term at the time, but I, I was able to distribute my energy more evenly. Mm -hmm. And I was strong. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, like Mark McCoy, Mark McCoy would beat everybody for the first five hurdles. Yeah. But we never worried about him because he, he didn't have the back end. Yeah. He'd run so fast, he didn't have the energy distribution. And he'd just tie up and then you just catch him at eight, run past him at nine and ten. Mm -hmm. uh, he got better, obviously, when he won the, the gold medal, but yeah. a lot of his career, he was a front runner. Mm -hmm. You know, and then there are guys now that say, well, it takes me a while to, I'm a build runner. And I said, you know, 13 flat doesn't catch 13 flat. <laughs> it just doesn't. So you can't spot somebody three meters right. and think you're going to catch them because you're not running your race. You're chasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just putting more stress on you. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, most of these. Listen, it's all results driven. So I can't argue with anyone. Who am I to tell Grant Holloway, right? Who's the world who broke my high school collegiate record running 1298. Who am I to tell him, and he's the best in the world right now, what he's not doing right. right. But what I can say is that he received what I said because he's trying to get better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, he's not complacent. Well, nobody's better than me right now, so that's good. Right. No, he's like, no, I'm trying to get better. And I said, yeah, you should always want to learn exactly. to get better. That's the only way you're going to improve, you know. So because somebody is going to come along that's going to be as good. And if you haven't tried to get better, then they're going to run by you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, McLeod, the Jamaican, right. he was he was the best for a couple of years, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. His hurling technique is horrible. <laughs> horrible. Yeah. And when you're running the same time as everybody else and they're, they're a better hurdler, that's the person who's going to win. Yeah. You know, and speed, you can have too much speed. Uh, I've told so many people, you don't need you don't need but 10 5 10 4 speed you don't need 10 2 10 flat sub 10 speed you can't use it you cannot use that speed you know you you never get a chance to use it because you're over stride and uh you know like terence Tramiel, i mean yeah. all the speed he had but he just it's too much speed to try to control mm -hmm. so less is better mm -hmm. uh nowadays so it's not the speed that matters. It's, I think, Gene, you can chime in. I think if, if you're a technically sound hurdler, you can get stronger and you can get faster. Mm -hmm. But what you can't get as you get older uh, in years, meaning the more years that you're not technically sound, the harder it is going to is going to be to correct it because time doesn't allow you to take longer. Why right. do you like to be in the I feel like doing it. Okay. Um, my screen, I just see Spider-Man. Uh, <laughs> I'm using it, so it should be good now. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, yeah, and, and in terms of when you're talking about conditioning, I mean, some things are just so very basic, and I think a lot of the sport is just thinking basically. The stronger you are, 
the more relaxed you can run while you're putting out what you consider to be 100% or 95%. Mm -hmm. And if you're not in shape and you really start to press, you're only going to tighten up. You're not going to keep loose. You're not at, at hurdling, especially. Can you imagine a, a hurdler who gets tight? You've got to be so loose in order to navigate that. Yes. So your ability to maintain your relaxation while you're putting out completely depends on your condition. Mm -hmm. And the more you relax, the better you're going to utilize whatever your natural speed is. So, right, I don't know if that answers it or not. Yeah, the, <laughs> uh, I want to give a little, a little time for any participants who have any questions. Uh, so if anybody has a question for Ronaldo or Coach Coach Jean Poquet, uh, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. Okay, Hector, Hector has a question. Those who don't know, Hector Cotto is, is one of my uh, former athletes who ran for Puerto Rico. I think ran 13, what's your best, Hector? 1349, 39, something like that. Uh, so Hector's asking, did, did you have any, did you do anything in particular to work flexibility? Well, well in, in, in high school, you know, we had gymnastics class and all that. And, you know, I like to do flips and all that. So flexibility, you know, stretching and, Trying to do a split, you know, as much as you know, as close as closely as I could. Um, yeah, when you're a young kid, you just, you know, all that's important. I knew I had to have uh, good flexibility because you're almost kind of doing a quasi Russian split over every hurdle. Um, so I was very flexible, um, which helped uh, tremendously. I spent a lot of time just stretching, you know, whether that was 20 minutes of sustained stretching, hamstring, quads, with all, all the little muscles, uh, groin, all that. Um, I think I still stretch probably more today than a lot of uh, the world-class athletes, just because I like to feel, you know, loose. Um, yeah, so that was the extent of my, my flexibility was, to, uh, you know, in uh, gymnastics, things of that nature, learning how to do that. Kind of makes me think of another question I, I had in mind, which was your your posture, because you ran much more upright than traditional. Um, and I, I'd assume that it was your flexibility that allowed you to do so. Yeah, I never, I had, you know, I always think that, you know, obviously the mechanics of hurdling uh, has to be somewhat constant with every hurdler, but we all look a little different. Yeah. But the mechanics, you know, have to be kind of the same, the biomechanics. Um, but it was my flexibility that a lot of people said it looked like I was upright. I just think I was so fast over the hurdles in my unitization that I could get, get you know, I'm on the ground and I'm upright a lot mm -hmm. faster because my flexibility allowed everything to mm -hmm. happen at one time, mm -hmm. all at once. So I didn't spend a lot. Like for instance, if 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 I wasn't flexible, then I'd have to have an an exaggerated uh, dive. Uh, some people you need to dive just to get momentum. I had enough speed, I had enough strength, so I just had to you know be in the right position over the top. But I get down so quick that, that that's what it looked like. I was vertical, mm -hmm. but um, if you slowed it down, I was in the dive position. I just got down off the ground faster, and I was up vertically running. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Um, and then I'd, it also, by getting, getting up so quickly, I could get my knees up because the hurdles were coming up fast, <laughs> you know, because if I stayed in that dive long, as you know, gravity would pull you. wouldn't you. get your lead leg up. Yeah. You wouldn't get, your, your chest would keep your knee from coming up. Right. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't be able to get back up. Gravity would pull me down. Right. Uh, another but question. If he, drew, if he drew a line through his head throughout the race. His head never dipped down under that line or came way up above it either. If he had a line through his ears in a straight line, and pretty much maintained that line all the way down the line. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, we got another question from Hector Cotto. Um, this is for Ronaldo. Did, any, did anything feel different? Uh, 1299 over 39 versus 1299 over 42 inches. Let's see. Let's go with that question first. Well, yes, it was different because in the high school, it's the first time it's ever done. So it was a new experience. I fully expected to and, and was working toward breaking 13 the entire time I entered college. Um, I almost felt that my legs were gonna fall off me in that world record race <laughs> because I was running so quickly trying to get away from Foster. <laughs> um, but I can honestly tell you, I never thought about that I was gonna fall. You know, I hear about guys talking about, what do you do when a hurdle comes up too, too fast? And I said, just attack it. <laughs> and I, I was never afraid. I just figured, I didn't think I was gonna fall, but if, I wasn't afraid to fall, if that makes sense. Right. You know, I, I, G knows I, I would give 100%, period. You know, I, I didn't run a race 80%, 85%. Now, in county meets when I didn't have to run that fast, yeah, I didn't run 100%, you know, because I had to run other events. But when it mattered, I was at 100% all the time. And so when we were running faster and breaking national records, because each time is a new plateau, mm -hmm. um, I just knew I had to get faster. We knew in practice we'd have to recreate a faster environment for my legs, mm -hmm. you know, to run faster. Mm -hmm. And so we would just, you know, create it on the spot in practice, try this, try that, you know, mm -hmm. and we weren't afraid to do it. and. If he brought it up, I'd try it, even if I was unsure, but I would try it because I wanted to run faster. Right. Yeah, I think that's important for coaches to hear, the importance of creating drills, workouts, different spacings and whatnot to fit the issues that you're, that you're dealing with in races, as opposed to having a set plan. You know, I think that, that that sounds like a big reason for your success is that both of you were willing to experiment and explore together. I agree. Yeah. Another question from Hector. What do you think the limit is in the 110 in terms of the world record? <laughs> Interesting. The limit? Uh, human possible limits for the 110 over 42. I don't know limits. I know. Something in the twelve sevens is possible. Mm -hmm. now, yeah, I don't, yeah, we don't know the limit till till there is a limit. But that's right. Um, I do believe I always thought, even when I was running, um, you know, you could run. I thought 12, 12, 79, 12, 78. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, I think on my natural progressions, and with the advent of all these these synthetic tracks and the lighter hurdles. Mm -hmm. um, you know, had had my career not been interrupted by football, uh, you know, I ran 1282 and 1286 and didn't get credit for it because they said the, the, the watch malfunction. So when back in my day, nobody thought you could run that fast. Today, you run that fast, you get the time. So um, I clearly know that I would have uh, been right in that area. Um, it's going to take a special a special race. There's no such thing as a perfect race, but you're going to have to have the ideal conditions and, and have a little luck going your way, you know? And I also think um, someone's gonna have to be running 12.9 low to get you to go, you know what I mean? 12.8 to get you to go. I don't think someone's gonna be running 13.2, you can run 12.79 by yourself. That's not gonna happen. So, so the thought of that happening may be somewhat unlikely because a lot of things have to go right. <laughs> a lot of things have to go right. Yeah. But I'd love to see Grant Grant Holloway do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if anybody seems like they're heading in that direction, it would be him. <laughs> what uh, uh, off season or even in season weight room work did you do to prepare yourself? I know you said uh, you did a lot of things with flexibility. And, and is that one of the reasons why you felt like even as a shorter hurdler that you was able to to manipulate those hurdles so so easily 
Well, we had a universal gym in our high school, you know, just a little bench press and the curls. So, you know, I prided myself on trying to be the strongest guy. I may have been 150 pounds, but I felt I was physically strong. And then when I went to college, you know, obviously you have more advanced systems and, and uh, weight coaches, strength coaches. So I got introduced to a little bit more uh, advanced training and I became very strong then, you know, doing all, you know, you know, power cleans and different things of that nature. Um, not bulky, but just really strong for my size. Um, and I think that's important. Um, I didn't I didn't really lift a lot with my legs because I did so much running. Um, so I did more you know, upper body, shoulders, triceps, of course my chest, uh, abs, things like that, calves, soleus, um, Quad, quad work, meaning uh, uh, more range of motion strengthening, uh, functional training, you know, functional strength training, as opposed to just getting strong, because if, if it wasn't being useful in the event, it didn't matter, you know. I didn't need to have big uh, thighs when, but I needed to have very strong uh, calves and a strong and uh, pliable Achilles tendon, you know, that kind of thing. Um, in hurling, I never pulled a hamstring ever, hmm. you know, and I, you know, so I wasn't a hamstring hurdler. I was, I was a lead leg hurdler, but it came from through the, the quad, through the knee. So Gene taught me to come up through the knee as opposed to the swing motion that you have a lot of people swing and then you got to pull back down. So that's twice taxing on that hamstring. Uh, so I never had problems with my hamstrings, uh, at all. Um, yeah, my injuries happen though, doing things that I shouldn't do that had nothing to do with track. <laughs> but, yeah, I can honestly say I never got hurt running track. Well, I did get hurt. I, I pulled a hamstring uh, as a sophomore, but I think that's because I was so small and I was running so aggressively because I was a fierce competitor and just, you know, it was unfortunate. But, um, you know, I went from 15 3 as a sophomore to 13-6 state record as a junior in that time span. And so that progression, you really can't explain it outside of it. I got stronger. I learned a lot from Gene. I was hungry. But when people ask me my progressions, I said, you don't want to know my progressions because they don't add up. 15-3 <laughs> doesn't, and the next time you run is 13-6. That doesn't make sense. And then the next time you run is 12-9. So that progression is kind of crazy. But it happened. <laughs> it did happen. Now, do you feel like because you didn't swing your leg and you drove your knee, that that was one of the reasons that contributed you being able to get your lead leg down faster? Yeah. Gene would stand on his, I mean, Gene couldn't go over a hurdle, obviously, but he would do the knee motion. He would show me and he'd do the trail leg motion. We'd put the hurdle down low and I'd just watch him do it. And I could just see what the knee was doing, the right angle. And then the, and then when you're extending over it and it opens, it's kind of bent. So I'm not up here and pulling up and because if you throw the lead leg up, you go up. <laughs> you got to wait for your body to come back down. It's like a whole two different pieces. So, you know, Gene would always piece it together almost like, like a stick figure, but him doing it. And I just watch it. And then I try to say, okay, I can see that happening. And yeah, he just did everything perfectly that I understood it. And then we trial and error. Everything we did was trial and error, unitization. I remember Gene, remember it took me a while to understand what that, mm -hmm. that was and what that mm -hmm. feel was. And he'd say it all the time, unitize, unitize. I'm like, what, 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 what? And then when I finally get it, he goes, that's it. And I didn't know I was doing it. I had to take his word for it. So I'd say, okay, I know what that felt like. Let me see if I can feel that again. And he'd say, that's it. And then as I kept doing it, I knew what that feel was. So then that feel became something that I was familiar with. So I would run to make that feel. And that became a part of my hurling. Everything was feeling what he was saying through his words. And he would give me affirmation, which told me I was doing exactly what he wanted me to do. And so I would, every time I go over a hurdle, I'd try to feel that feeling I had based on his affirmation. And you do that countless times, then it becomes... Oh, okay. So now I'm running for feel. I'm running for feel. 
I'm not worried about the hurdle. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to replicate the feel. I'm trying to replicate what he said. And so his words became a feel, visual imagery for me. And so we didn't spend a lot of time, like I said, trying to time out a race. If it wasn't, it was like building blocks, do this over and over and over again. And I would feel it, do this over and over and over again. And I would feel it. And yeah, even, even the intervals, he's barking at me about the intervals and keeping up with Joe and the guys. Um, <laughs> and I would do it and not, you know, despise him for it, but I would do it. And you know, you go run a race if you haven't done anything all year and you run something crazy and you're like, I'm gonna do what he says from now on. I'm gonna do what he says from now on. Yeah. Great questions. Any other questions for Ronaldo or Coach Coach Boquette? Yeah, I got one more. So you guys made that video in 1991, High Hurdles. I think it was <laughs> Championship Productions. And you know, and I have a copy of the VHS somewhere. I, I know I still have it somewhere. <laughs> Is there a way to, you guys can like reintroduce this, replicate it, bring it back, the 36 minute thing that you both guys did in 91? Because you can't find it anywhere. <laughs> that I know of, you know. Uh, when you say reintroduce or replicate, what do you mean by that? <laughs> we can bring it back on the market. Oh. Get as long as we don't have to go to Iowa. Yeah, well, I'm just saying, if, 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 it, if it somehow you guys can get it from Change Reduction to put it on YouTube or whatever you can do so that we can see some of these things more. So I remember it was a good video, but again, it was on VHS, unless you convert things over. There is no DVD version of this thing. And we didn't, we never got to fully uh, complete the video the way we wanted to. I was injured, remember that, Gene? Yeah. And so some of the workouts that we wanted to be a part of that video, I was not able to do. I think of the jammings, mm. I was not able to do. Right. We did as much as we could within my physical uh, condition. Um, yeah, I remember that day like it was yesterday. I was so upset that, man, you know, we can't even put, you know, the real workouts that we want to do, which, which was the speed training part. So that's an element that wasn't, I don't think, in that, that, that championship production. There is a, on YouTube, there is a clip from that video, I know, but not the whole thing. And Hector just said in the chat that he, he has the, the VHS, and he, can, he can convert it into digital. So. Yeah, if I said anything, I think flexibility is so important for hurdlers. Uh, mm -hmm. And they need to spend a decent amount of time uh, with their flexibility um, because, you know, as you get based on your conditioning, that affects your flexibility in the race. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, the more, more flexible you are, the stronger you are, the more oxygen that goes throughout your body. If, you, if you're not fit, you're not flexible, you know, the, the muscles aren't getting the oxygen, so they can't sustain themselves at that high level but for so long. So you see a lot of guys, you know, they're so erratic in their times because basically they're just not fit. And and there's a fitness to hurdling. Uh, like I said, uh, Grant Holloway, you know, he can run, you know, 44, 40, whatever in the 400. You know, he can run sub 20 in the 200. So clearly he's fit, you know, uh, he's going above and beyond. Every hurdler doesn't have to run that to run fast. Mm -hmm. You know, there's different ways to get there. Um, Daniel Roberts ran, I think he ran, what, 13 flat uh, mm -hmm. as, as a senior in college. Um, but he's not a good technical hurdler. Right. And so he needs to spend time to perfect his technique. I think he's, he's a, he could be Grant Holloway's worst nightmare, but Grant's almost 6'5". Mm -hmm. So Grant doesn't have to work that hard on his technique over the hurdle. Daniel Roberts is, might be a slight bit shorter than I am. I'm six six one, and so if your technique isn't good and you're not as tall, your margin of error is smaller. Yeah, you know. So that's, you know, he's he's ideal height six one, but he needs to. I think he needs to get a little bit more flexible so that he can be a little bit more fluid mm -hmm. uh, over the top of the hurdle. And that's the key for all hurdlers. You know, you gotta. It's a combination. Gene talks about conditioning. And then, of course, um, technical aspect of hurdling. A lot of high schools and even colleges, because of your calendars, you don't have time 
put in the time of the breaking down the hurdle. You know, you're spending time with a watch. Everybody's <laughs> watch conscious. And I think you need to go back to fundamentals because if you, if you can put in the right technique, that's going to take you farther than anything else. All the speed in the world, be a bad technique, it ends up with a bad result at some point. Yeah, Bernard, Bernard, you asked, when you asked Ronaldo a question, you mentioned about when you swing the leg, right? Yes, and the point is, when does your toe get a, a, ahead of your knee in the lead leg action? Well, it should be as you're, you drive the knee up and then right. as you're over the hurdle, you want your toe to get ahead of your sure, knee. Sure, sure. And if the toe gets ahead of the knee very early, that's mm -hmm. a swing. Okay. But with, but you're you're really leading into the hurdle with your knee, and okay. you it's a step. It's not a, a swing. It's it's a big step. It's like you're stepping over the hurdle. You're not you're not jumping and you're not swinging your leg over. So where your toe is in relation to your knee, that toe doesn't want to get ahead of the knee too early in the in the motion it's the knee leading into the hurdle and then of course you get up over the hurdle that will also allow you to and when you are approaching the hurdle too quickly it'll let you make the adjustment and still be able to get it over but a lot of guys they get up too close to the hurdle and they they can't get that knee up and then they swing up into the hurdle yeah tony d's ran 1305 Tony Dees was six, probably six four, but he had a swing lead leg. Mm -hmm. That's why he couldn't run on a thirteen. Mm -hmm. He had the ability to run on a thirteen, but when you're running against a guy like me or someone else who doesn't have a swing leg, and they're putting more pressure on you, and you're overstriding with a swing leg, yeah, you're either crashing into the to the crossbar. That's, that's what ended up having to foster a lot yeah, of the time. He's just crashing into the, the crossbar. Because he, you know, what's faster, as Gene always say, you know, swinging the leg up or bending and going. You know, can you do that faster than you can do this? The whole thing, you know, it's a whole lever when it's swinging, as opposed to when you bend the knee. Entirely you different muscle knee, group. Get more power. Yeah, it's a different muscle group. So, do you think discounting those hurdles so they don't feel like they're too far away? Because sometimes my hurdles feel like they're too far away, so they're almost like almost swinging and long jumping into the hurdle uh, to try to get their three steps. I'm trying to explain it's the momentum going into the hurdle that carries to the next one, but trying to get that to translate has been so very difficult. Um, is there a certain drill that you kind of? Are you only training at ten yards? Yes. There's your problem. Okay. You can't create race conditions and practice by yourself. You know, the, the adrenaline isn't there. You might want to, but you know, it's different than race day. So that's how Gene got me to get my, my rhythm and my cadence by jamming, bringing the hurdles in to get those legs to work faster, which was getting me stronger, by the way, Gene, mm -hmm. in, my, in my sprinting between the hurdles. And then when a race came up and you put them at 10, I was doing the same thing as, but it was 10 yards, not eight and a half, nine yards, you know? And, and, um, I think the only time I did 10 yards was, um, in the race because I really never didn't practice like, the 10 yards. Yeah. Never practice the 10 yards and never practice at 120 yards full, full flight. Yeah. I couldn't replicate the same, uh, adrenaline needed to, to get the, this the rhythm for three steps the fast three steps at 10 yards in practice so we jam it because gene always wanted that tempo and that rhythm and so only time i ran at 10 yards was race day i don't think gene we, we didn't ever really work out at 10 yards never yeah never yeah it was always you know eight and a half nine yards mm -hmm. and then then they can get and you you'll find out that they can do the three steps and as they get more confidence, they'll have more power in those three steps. And then you can play games by moving them out three more inches without telling them. And they'll still be doing the three steps, but never do it at 10. You know, so those kind of things you can do, you know, 
But 10 yards is kind of hard for people to do that in practice. They don't get it, you know. Well, I want to thank you so much because I promise you this has been a lifelong dream to talk to you. I've uh, been from Maryland, uh, grew up in Maryland, so we hear about Ronaldo, we hear about Skeets Nehemiah. Um, your conditioning, um, you ran 46 in the 400, correct? In high school. In, in high, high school, 46.5. Oh. You ran 44.2 at the Pens when yeah, he was in college. I ran 44.2 yeah. in 19.3. Uh, do you feel like that also, just that, that strength over 400 meters, you're not going to get tired in the 110s because you're just that strong? Um, do you encourage 110 hurdlers to do more 400 meter work? Yeah, yes. Alan Johnson ran 44 as well. Um, yeah, once you accept it as a part of your training, then it, I think it has a profound effect on your psyche and your confidence from a strength standpoint. I mean, if you can embrace 400 meters, which takes some time to do, because that's a hard race. But once you're able to accept that and comfortably run it, 110 is nothing, nothing. But you put forth the same effort in the 110 as you do the 400, meaning that I want to feel just as exhausted after the 110 as I do at the 400. Otherwise I haven't run, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And I heard a rumor that you, like 20 years ago, I was in college, that you could still run 48 uh, seconds in the 400. <laughs> when? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably about, about 15, 20, 20 years ago. You could, you could still run a 48. Uh, that might be greatly exaggerated. Yeah. It might be greatly exaggerated. <laughs> yeah. I never ran another 400 after that pen relays 400. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still recovering from that. <laughs> <laughs> we have a, another question in the chat. Um, when you do the when you discount the hurdles for the gym and workout, do you discount the first hurdle? Say yeah, it again. It was touchdown to touchdown. Oh, okay. Uh, do you, do you discount the first hurdle? You mean from start to the first hurdle? Yeah, uh, the forty-five. Yeah, feet? that doesn't count. Okay, that's what I yeah. thought. Yeah, you you, uh, you start the clock when when the lead foot touches down over the first hurdle. And you stop it, let's say after the fifth hurdle. So you're really getting the time for the for the four hurdle of the ten yards, and that establishes the time. We, um, I don't even know. I mean, I'm sure we worked on it and stuff like that. But how how much time, Ronaldo, did we, in terms of percentage of time, how much time did we actually work on just starts to the first hurdle? First of all, ten, when we work that starts, we always use two hurdles because there's a tendency with one to start yeah. to quit before you're before you're over the first hurdle. So right. if you're working on starts, you should always do it with two hurdles because you want to come off and go to the second hurdle and you're not going to quit. Right. You want to stay stay in attack mode off the first yeah, that's and not right. quit in the air. You know, most right. people just get to the first hurdle, take off and then we don't know what you're doing because you're not no. competing. We didn't, maybe 10% of the time, Gene. We didn't, not, it wasn't not a lot. very much. No. Yeah. No. I think the question is, would you move the first hurdle in at all? The first, the first hurdle, hurdle in? No, you never touch it. It's to work. <laughs> so what? No, no, what, our touchdowns, the touchdowns were the only time that we, no. Let me think. First hurdle was a constant. First, first hurdle is wherever it's supposed to be in a race. Okay, yeah. that's the constant, and then you can fool around with two, three, four, five, whatever. But right, you, yeah, you have to have fifteen yards. Right, you know, seven, eight steps, whatever you do. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Anyone? Three. I'll Ooh. hop in one more time. <laughs> <laughs> Versus men. Um, I know you talked about, you know, having that forward lean. Do you look at w training women going over the hurdle versus men going over the hurdle? Do you take that any differently? A lot of it depends on the height of the woman. You know, uh, Kenny Harrison, who is the, the, the best American, uh, she's not that tall, but she's technically pretty good. 
Um, there are a lot of taller hurdlers now that are just sprinting because a hurdle is not really an effort. Um, there's a mixed bag, but there's, and there's been an argument for years for them to raise it so they'd be forced to hurdle more. But um, yeah, the, you know, she's shown even the taller girls, you know, technique matters. Yeah. And so she's, she's learned the right technique. I, she just ran, it was 12.54 in the, in, in the heats yesterday. And then the finals was win eight, but she ran 12.38. And wow, I mean, win eight or not, 12.38 is moving. And she wasn't hitting hurdles or anything, and and she has to hurdle them because she's probably she looks like she's about five four. Yeah. Uh, so she's not a tall girl, um, but she has everything moving in the right direction. She, she leads with her knee. She's not a swing hurdler. Um, has her arms pretty tight and uh, you know going forward and back the way they should be going. Not a lot of wasted energy. Uh, yeah. So a lot of the girls, to me, a lot of the girls. The real good girls, to me, are better technical hurdlers than the guys. You know, yeah. they, they just aren't physically as strong. You know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Again, thank you for your time. You're welcome. Okay, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up. We're about half an hour over our time here, uh, but um. With another whole set of questions I had that I didn't get to, Ronaldo. Uh, maybe we could do a part two. Um, we want to talk some about uh, the Wilbur Ross training that you did that that year, that summer. Um, wanted to, wanted to look at some of the races that we have on that on that uh, fifty four minute video and and break some of those down because because it looks to me like there was a progression in your in your style, subtle progression in your style from 78 to 82 they would like to look at. And uh, so maybe we can get, get together again, maybe next month or so and, okay. uh, and, and finish right. it. <laughs> but okay. I want to thank Ronaldo, obviously, uh, your graciousness and kindness and hopping on here. Uh, just to hear you and Gene talk <laughs> feels like I'm in the middle of a conversation that's going back 40 years or so. <laughs> Uh, so that was really cool. And Joe, Joe Goody, uh, former teammate from high school, glad to see you guys. It's a really, really special thing. And everybody who was able to make it today um, and uh, ask questions and, and pick the brains here, thanks, thanks so much. So I'm recording this. Um, I plan to, like the last time, with the, with the first one I did, to uh, put it in my Dropbox and then I can send you the uh, the Dropbox version, or just add you to the list on the Dropbox. Just add your email to it. I'll just go on a list of people who are on the on the call. I'll just do it that way, so you don't have to you don't have to ask for it. Okay. Um, and Hector will most likely make an edited version uh, as well, um, which will take a while. <laughs> uh, you know, get rid of some of the some of the uh, stuff that. Wasn't wasn't as wasn't as cogent or whatnot. Maybe add some add some video footage and stuff. All right. Okay. All right. So again, thanks everyone and thank you. So for now, thank you. you. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.